Thank you for joining for the Up in Smoke e-cigarettes and other tobacco products lecture. This lecture will be covering what we know about e-cigarettes as of today and covering some of the misinformation that is oftentimes led in the public. This is a presentation that's designed for healthcare providers so that you are able to better have conversations with the patients, clients, and families that you may be serving. My name is Ellie Parker, and I'm with Twin Cities Medical Society, where I'm the Physician Advocacy Network Project Coordinator. A little bit about the Physician Advocacy Network. I know most of you that will be listening to this are probably community health workers, and the Physicians Advocacy Network is a project of Twin Cities Medical Society to engage, educate, and empower physicians to learn more about new tobacco products so that they can become better advocates both in their communities and in their patient rooms. So Twin Cities Medical Society has had a long history of working in tobacco control prevention. In 2007, when Minnesota passed the Clean Indoor Air Law, Minnesota physicians were very active and they advocated strongly and spoke out about the dangers of secondhand smoke. So that's really how we began our work in this. And then we fast forward to 2015 and more and more communities in Minnesota were debating what to do when it came to clean indoor air and e-cigarettes. So we were continuously called upon to provide physician advocacy once again. But what we learned was that physicians didn't actually know enough about e-cigarettes to be able to be the best advocates. So what we did was develop a curriculum so that we can actually educate physicians about these new tobacco products. That way they're better served whenever they are called upon to be advocates in their communities. And that's really where we're able to give them opportunities to become advocates both in their local communities, statewide, and also within their patient rooms as well, so they can better care for their patients. We do have a variety of educational resources available. You can visit those at panmn.org, so www.panmn.org. And on our website, there are e-cigarette toolkits that you may also find valuable when working with patients and different clients. There are tons of resources to learn more about e-cigarettes and some of the frequently asked questions along with usage rates and the latest scientific research available on these products. So what we're going to be talking about today is we are actually going to describe current, current trendy tobacco products such as e-cigarettes. We'll cover both the public health and the medical risk associated with e-cigarettes. So the first half of the presentation is focusing more on the public health side of what are these products and why are there public health concerns. And then we'll also highlight some medical risks that are associated with both e-cigarettes and nicotine. And then we will also take a look at how to have meaningful conversations with those that might be using these products and how to combat some of the bias that society places on these products. And then we would be ill-served to not discuss tobacco cessation related to e-cigarettes. That's a common misnomer is that e-cigarettes are actually an approved cessation device, so they are not an FDA-approved cessation product. And so we will talk about how to have those conversations with individuals that may be seeking e-cigarettes to help them reduce tobacco use. So why did this project start? Like I mentioned, we knew that physicians didn't have enough knowledge about e-cigarettes. And I'm going to use physicians, but when I say that, please know that this could be healthcare providers, this is nurses, this is anyone in the medical field, and most likely including community health workers. So this was a study from 2014 that actually took a look um, and examined what do physicians know about e-cigarettes. And you can see that over about 90% were aware that e-cigarettes were a product, but their knowledge and comfort discussing these products were substantially less. However, the majority of respondents cited that they would like to know more about e-cigarettes, which is really why we developed this presentation. When you look more closely at where healthcare providers were learning about e-cigarettes, you can see that the majority, this is a heat graph, so the top, um, the very top, the center where it says patient, 62% reported actually learning about these products directly from their patients, news stories, or from advertisements. So we really saw an opportunity where they could be receiving biased information as opposed to medical research evidence. Let's actually take a look at what e-cigarettes are. So e-cigarettes first became available in the United States in 2007. They were actually developed by a Chinese scientist who lost his father to lung cancer. So he decided to start thinking of a way to make a, quote, safer product that would have less harm associated with it. 
So in 2007, those were available in the United States. And as of early 2014, there were over 400 different brands and 7,000 different flavors of e-cigarette products. And why this is worth mentioning is for a couple different reasons. First of all, each of the big tobacco companies have their own brand of e-cigarette. So we know that this is a business that is growing and there is definitely um, money available in this. And then when we think about how we Right now, there's a gap in that we don't have as much research as we, as we would like, but that could be contributed to the fact that we have so many different products that are not standardized right now that it's very hard to conduct research because products don't cross-compare, so it's almost like comparing apples to bananas to oranges. It's very hard to conduct studies when there's not enough similarities between the products. So what is actually an e-cigarette? An e-cigarette has many different names that you should be aware of. Some people call it an e-cigarette. Some call it a vape pen. You may hear it referred to as a personal vaporizer. And then oftentimes in policy, it's referred to as an electronic nicotine delivery system or an ENDS. So there are many different names, and this causes confusion because a lot of times people aren't sure if they're even talking about the same product. They're battery-operated devices that are designed to deliver nicotine and other flavorings. You almost think of it as they're designed to do everything that a cigarette does, just instead of being lit, it's actually dr um, driven by battery. So when we look at the different types of e-cigarettes, on the left, you'll see what's called a disposable e-cigarette, and on the right, a rechargeable. So a disposable e-cigarette, this would be like your blue e-cigarettes that you might see in convenience stores. And these are very convenient them because all you do is you purchase them and they come with a small cap on the back that you take off. And then right there, the e-cigarettes ready to be inhaled and used. Whereas on the right, those types of e-cigarettes actually require that you charge the device. And you, so you charge the device very similar to how you would your cell phone. So you have a USB port and it plugs directly into the e-cigarette. And then you'll notice the top part of the right hand side where it's actually looking clear below the, the tip where you would inhale, that's where the liquid nicotine is stored or the e-juice and we're going to talk about that more as well. So the right side, that's the rechargeable, they usually come as a starter kit and that's there's a lot more complicated process and, and we'll look at that further as we go on. How it actually works is that there are three main pieces and this, this does not vary whether it's a dis a disposable e-cigarette or a rechargeable. So you have a battery which actually powers the device, the atomizer which heats the e-liquid, and then the clearomizer. So if you look in the picture on the right, you can see the pieces taken apart separately. And the clearomizer is where you store the e-liquid. And again, that's where individuals use the liquid nicotine bottles to fill directly that piece. And then the atomizer heats that e-liquid. And then when you inhale through the mouthpiece, it creates the water vapor, or I shouldn't call it water vapor, we'll talk about that as well, but that the vapor that's released that often looks like smoke. So liquid nicotine, e-juice, this is the nicotine that's used in e-cigarettes. So when you're not using a disposable e-cigarette, you have a bottle that looks very similar to this picture right here, and they range in strength from zero milligrams to 24 milligrams per milliliter. So labels are, or bottles are often labeled with how many milligrams there are, but it's worth noting that oftentimes people aren't aware how much they are using and that there, again, there isn't much standardization among the products. So zero milligrams would be low, whereas 24 would be very high. But studies have found that oftentimes, however the product is marketed or labeled, isn't off, off is not usually what actually is reflected in the product. So what I mean by that is that it can, may be labeled as being nicotine free when it actually does contain nicotine. And then some that are labeled as 18 milligrams per milliliter may actually only have 12 to 14. So there's no way for us to actually know how many milligrams of nicotine are in those bottles. And again, that's because they're mixed right there on the spot in the shops where they are purchased. They come in hundreds of flavors often very youth-friendly flavors, ranging from cotton candy to bubble gum to apple pie to Red Bull, blueberry slushy. Almost any flavor that you can think of that comes in candy or juice is, often, is available as well in e-cigarettes. And so this is a major public health concern because we know that kids are enticed to these products that smell very fruity as well and that the tobacco companies are very smart in how they market these products to attract kids as well. 
E-cigarettes can be purchased in a variety of places, including gas stations, convenience stores, specialty adult shops. By that, we mean tobacco-only stores. So these are the e-cigarette shops that you might actually see appearing in strip malls within your communities where you go in and you're offered a variety of different products. And then internet retail. And this is a really big concern when it comes to public health because in Minnesota, you must be 18 to purchase e-cigarettes. However, online, it's very hard to verify that you are 18 years or not. So if you notice on the left, that's the blue electronic cigarettes webpage. And all you have to do is click that yes, you're over the age of 18 to be able to enter their website and purchase products. Same thing on the right from the Enjoy e-cigarette brand. So there's not a lot of um, ways that discourage kids from being able to access these products. They simply just have to click that they are over the age of 18. And if they decide that maybe the first time was scary, but they want to reload the page and click again that they are over 18, there's really no way to prevent them from doing so. When we talk about the cost comparisons between e-cigarettes and conventional cigarettes, e-cigarettes are oftentimes very much less, so they cost less. So disposable e-cigarettes, these are the ones where you simply pop the cap off and they're ready to be used. They usually range from $7 to $9, but they can last as long as two packs of cigarettes. So if we compare the cost between e-cigarettes and a pack per day smoker, we can see that disposable e-cigarettes would cost anywhere from $1,200 to $1,700 a year, whereas conventional tobacco at $8 a pack is going to almost cost someone $3,000. So that's a significant savings. And then rechargeable e-cigarettes, you almost have to look at those as an investment. So they cost more because, and they all range in price depending upon how long the battery lasts. So that's a big selling point. But they range from $60 to $100 for the starter pack, and then you only have to buy the liquid nicotine from there on out. So if over the cost of a, or over the length of a year, you're going to spend between $700 to $900 total. So again, that's almost $2,000 cheaper than conventional tobacco, which is another reason why not only youth are attracted to these products, but even adults, that it's a, it's a much cheaper way to receive nicotine. Next, we're going to take a look at the marketing of e-cigarettes. As I've mentioned, each of the big tobacco companies have their own brand of e-cigarettes, and currently e-cigarettes, there's no regulation how they can be advertised. So tobacco companies being smart and having experience in marketing tobacco products, they are using many of the same strategies that they once used when they marketed conventional tobacco. So you may remember that more doctors used to smoke Lucky Brand cigarettes than any other type of cigarettes, but today more doctors vape than use traditional cigarettes. They use celebrities. So on the right, that's Stephen Dorff, who's a celebrity. And even if you, in the advertisement on the left is an old cigarette advertisement. And so you'll notice that even the outfits are very similar. They both have that kind of tough, rugged man look. And so they use celebrities to promote these products. Jenny McCarthy is also a spokesperson for e-cigarettes. The same Jenny McCarthy that is against vaccinations promotes e-cigarettes. And she does a lot of commercials and she often talks about some of the social aspects of e-cigarettes and how they make her life a little simpler. They use sex appeal, so they refer to e-cigarettes as the way to smoke classy. It's the stylish way to do so. It won't make your clothes smell, your hair smell, your finger smell, your breath smell. It has none of those adverse side effects. And even if you just look at the dress dresses in the ads, they are very similar in the fact that they're both blue and silky. E-cigarettes are able to sponsor events where there's pr predominantly a youth market. So they can they can now um, they can sponsor music festivals, much like tobacco companies did back in the day. They can also put their advertisement on race cars and stock cars, so that as the cars go around and around and around, so does their brand. E-cigarettes are not an FDA-approved cessation device. They are not supposed to market themselves as a cessation device. But they also they often have very suggestive marketing that basically signifies, oh, why would you need to quit when you can switch? That e-cigarettes are harmless. It's a safe way to basically continue the habit of using nicotine. 
And this isn't going to play, I don't believe, but I would encourage you to use this link, and this would be the Jenny McCarthy video. And if you, even if you just go to youtube.com and you um, type in Jenny McCarthy e-cigarette spokesperson, you'll see her advertisements, and, and you'll see how they play up on some of those social factors related to e-cigarettes. And this is very concerning because, again, if you remember from the beginning that physicians were learning about these products from patients, and patients are learning about these products from the media and from society. And so they are receiving only a one, they're often biased information that only to, the tobacco company is presenting. As of just a couple weeks ago, so this would be of June of 2016, there are new FDA regulations. So the FDA will now regulate all tobacco products, including hookah, e-cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, all types of cigars, roll-your-own tobacco, pipe tobacco, and then any future tobacco products. So this is definitely a step in the right direction. Hopefully now with this regulation, there will be able to be more standardization among products, which will in fact lead to a more research being able to be done on these products. So the new FDA regulations require that all liquid nicotine and e-cigarettes, that, that ingredients are reported. So right now, they do not have to list the ingredients in liquid nicotine, but moving forward, they will. And then products that were not on the market as of February 15th, 2007, so this is almost every product, will now have to go back and sh prove that they meet the applicable the public health standard set by the law. So they're actually going to have to prove that they are not as harmful or that they're not harming the public. And then any future product going forward will be required to undergo pre-market review, which this is, this is a great rule for the fact that if today, for some reason, you decided that you wanted to open your own e-cigarette company and make your own liquid nicotine, you would have to go through this pre-market review. So this will hopefully limit the amount of new people that join this, this field and begin making liquid nicotine. And then health warnings will have to be placed on all products. And we are going to soon talk about the impact of nicotine. And so some of those, the harms that we are going to be discussing will have to be on these packages. So those are regulations that will be happening over the next couple of years. More immediate, as of August 2016, regulations will include that no one under the age of 18 will be able to purchase e-cigarettes both in person and online. We're yet to fully understand how they will regulate online sales, but, but that's definitely a step in the right direction. And then you will have to have photo ID to be able to purchase these products. Vending, mach vending machine sales will not be allowed outside of adult-only tobacco shops. And then free samples will no longer be able to be distributed. So currently right now, if you go into an e-cigarette shop, they have many different flavors that you can sample in the store. And so this will actually eradicate some of that as well. So these are definitely steps in the right direction. There's always room for improvement, but this is definitely moving forward and, again, allows us to better understand these products and place some regulations so that we can actually study these products so that we can make smart decisions about these products moving forward. So just to highlight the public health concerns, as I've mentioned, until just a month ago, these products were unregulated, therefore there are many unknowns. Literally anyone could be making these products wherever they wanted, and so there was really no way to be able to guarantee what these products had in them. As far as public health policy, e-cigarettes complicate smoke-free indoor air laws. As I mentioned, this is how this, this project began, is the fact that communities didn't know how to address this. And even right now, this is a hot topic as the the cities want the state to take action and the state kind of throws it back to the city saying this is a local issue. So as of today right now 50 percent of Minnesota is covered by e-cigarettes being included in clean indoor air law. So hopefully as we move forward the state will take action to go ahead and include e-cigarettes statewide in those clean indoor air laws. E-cigarettes are a gateway to regular cigarette use we know that the flavorings especially attract youth to try these products and that eventually they will graduate on. After they become addicted to nicotine, they'll graduate on to conventional tobacco. And that's, what it, that's a big fear and concern. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people claim that e-cigarettes are harmless because it's only water vapor that's released. 
That's not true. Water is not an ingredient in e-cigarettes. And then the vapor from e-cigarettes have been shown to contain toxic chemicals, heavy metals, and carcinogens. So it's not simply just water vapor. There are, in fact, other toxins being released into the air. As of 2014, 18% of Minnesotans that were adult had tried an e-cigarette. And if you look at the graph on the left, some of the reasons that people reported having tried e-cigarettes were because they believed them to be less harmful. They were trying to cut down on other tobacco or quit tobacco. So a lot of, again, that stigma or the fact that e-cigarettes may be helpful in reducing tobacco use, that's the society believes that. And so that's oftentimes why they try e-cigarettes. And then 78% were also just curious. But what I find more alarming is if you look at the graph on the right, this actually takes a look at the smoking status among those who had used an e-cigarette at least in the past 30 days. So 22% were former smokers. These are individuals who had successfully quit using nicotine only to be, re only to be reintroduced to nicotine through e-cigarettes. So that's just another way for them to um, be basically be become addicted again to nicotine. And then almost 12% were individuals that had no interest in using conventional tobacco, but they were interested in using an e-cigarette. And again, the, the nicotine's addictive and comes with many different health concerns. So that, that's alarming. When we look specifically at adolescent use in Minnesota, 28.4% of high school students have tried an e-cigarette, and almost 13% have used in the past 30 days. So this 13%, 13% suggests that these are more of your regular users, not teens that just tried it once with their friends, but they're actually using on a more regular basis. In this survey, it's through the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey, and this was done in 2014, and this year in 2016, this survey will be conducted again. So it will be interesting to see if this has increased. The national trend is that e-cigarette use has tripled in the past couple of years. But you'll notice that conventional cigarette use has decreased. It decreased by 8% in three years, which sounds great on the surface, but then when you take a take into account that kids may just be switching to e-cigarettes, it really paves the way that public health is going to have to educate teens about nicotine versus e-cigarettes, tobacco, and the other different type of products, but to focus more on nicotine. And then nationally, 93 to 96% of students are dual users, meaning that they use both e-cigarettes and conventional tobacco. What we suspect is that students probably use e-cigarettes in school environments or environments where they aren't able to use conventional tobacco. A lot of times schools don't have policies around e-cigarettes. Teachers maybe aren't aware of what these products are. So it's much easier for kids to use them. And then once they're out and about and not in a confined area, they're able to use conventional tobacco products. Seven out of 10 middle and high school students currently use flavored tobacco products. And that's again where the concern around the flavored e-cigarettes and the liquid nicotine comes from because we know that, that students use flavored products much more prevalent than conventional tobacco. So 63% have used flavored e-cigarettes, 61% have used flavored hookah, which we're going to talk about, and then 64% have used flavored cigars. So these are like your cigarillos and your flavored cigars that you see for sale in gas stations. A lot of times kids use flavored tobacco products because they believe them to be less dangerous and less addictive. When really we know that that's a way to introduce kids because it masks the harshness, it makes it taste good, and then eventually they graduate from needing those flavors. So over one-third of Minnesota students have tried a flavored cigar and 8% report using in the past 30 days. So tobacco is still definitely a problem, and more specifically flavored tobacco, which includes e-cigarettes, cigars, and the cigarillos, hookah, any type of flavoring. We'll briefly talk about hookah. Hookah is a water pipe that's used to smoke tobacco. So the hookah is the picture on the left. The base is filled with water. And then in the top part, charcoals are used to heat the tobacco. It is directly tobacco. It's just referred to as shisha, but it is tobacco. It's not liquid nicotine. It's tobacco. And 18% of high school students report ever smoking tobacco with a hookah. 
The picture on the right, the packet that looks like snus, that's actually the shisha. So that's the tobacco that's used in a hookah that's heated with charcoals. And then to the right of that, you'll notice that there are actual disposable hookah pins. So they're, they're marketed as hookah pins, but they contain liquid nicotine, much like an e-cigarette. It's just for marketing purposes that they actually call it e-hookah. They're flavored as well. I think the ones in the picture are peach and chocolate. The big public health concern around hookah is that hookah smoking sessions are a lot longer than conventional cigarette. You Like if you go out for a cigarette break, it's oftentimes 5 to 10 minutes, and you're going to take about 20 puffs, whereas a hookah session is on average an one hour in length, and you'll take 200 puffs. And so the exposure to inhaled smoke is much greater, and also the exposure to carbon monoxide as well. And hookah is a very social scene, so a lot of young adults are using this product, and they actually have hookah bars where you can go and use hookah with friends, you can drink alcohol while smoking hookah, so it's very much a, a social scene. So now we're actually going to take a look at the health impact of nicotine. So we keep talking about e-cigarettes and hookah and flavored cigars, but really it's, it's nicotine. And while e-cigarettes and some of these other new products have many unknowns, what we do know is that, that we scientifically know the effects of nicotine. And so really that's what we're talking about, is just a new way for nicotine to be, to be delivered through all of these variety of products. It's very difficult to compare the amount of nicotine in cigarettes and e-cigarettes because e-cigarettes don't deliver a systemic dose. And so that, therefore, it makes it very hard to compare how much nicotine someone might be getting from an e-cigarette. And this makes it difficult when you think about tobacco cessation because those individuals that may seek out an e-cigarette to help them quit, they may not be aware how much nicotine they're using or how much they're actually receiving. So in some cases, they're actually receiving more nicotine than they would with a cigarette, which may actually just make them more addicted or make the withdrawals more severe. The pharmacological effects of nicotine, it's highly addictive. So we know that nicotine is one of the most addictive drugs and that those with diabetes can experience insulin resistance, high blood sugar, higher A1C levels. So when you think about individuals, individuals with diabetes, they may be following their dietary restrictions. They may be using their insulin like they're supposed to and still having trouble. Well, this could be because if they're using an e-cigarette that they may not realize that the liquid nicotine is actually harming them. It increases the risk for heart disease, increases blood pressure, and then damages vascular tissue. Nicotine and youth development. So nicotine is harmful to youth development. We know that it's that basically what happens is that the youth brains don't stop developing until the mid-20s. And so if they start using nicotine at an early age, it basically cements those addiction pathways, making them more susceptible to addiction, lifelong addiction. And it also affects learning behaviors, attention, and it has many other side effects as well. So that's why we really encourage that, that there be more restrictions to prevent youth from taking on these products. Nicotine and fetal health. So evidence shows that fetal exposure to nicotine can have negative long-term effects, including impaired fetal and brain, brain and lung development. So this is definitely where it's important to have conversations with expecting mothers. Many expecting mothers maybe think that they're actually doing something safe and that they're doing something to improve the health of their baby by using an e-cigarette, when in fact they're still going to be harming their baby because of nicotine. So it's always worth having that conversation with a, an expecting mother, especially if you know that they're a tobacco user and they've suddenly been able to quit really easily. It may be because they've simply switched to e-cigarettes. So it's worth having that conversation. Liquid nicotine is very dangerous. So in Minnesota, liquid nicotine is sold with safety child caps, but we know that kids are they're very smart and they can oftentimes open those easier than even senior citizens can. So what's, what's concerning about that is that one-eighth of a teaspoon of liquid nicotine, so if a kid is able to open that bottle and be exposed to one-eighth of a teaspoon, which 
when you think about an eighth of, eighth of a te- teaspoon as far as a recipe is concerned, that's basically saying a dash. So one eighth is enough to poison a child under five years old. And this can happen through ingestion. So if they drink the bottle of liquid nicotine, which oftentimes it smells like juice. So that's, it's reasonable to believe that kids, if they open it, would drink it. Through skin contact. So even when you're filling your liquid nicotine, if you're putting that in your e-cigarette and it accidentally comes, if it drips onto your skin, that's a way to be poisoned. And then it can also be absorbed through eye contact. So if it squirts in, or if you accidentally squirt a drop into your eye, it can also be poisonous that way. In Minnesota, there's been an increase of children that have experienced nicotine poisoning. So in 2011, there was only one reported case, whereas 2014, there were 62 cases. So as e-cigarette use has become more frequent, more popular, you can see that exposure to nicotine poisoning has also increased. And that was as of 2014, and new data should soon be available. Um, so it's definitely something to consider that especially young kids are very susceptible to liquid nicotine poisoning. Nationwide, we see a very similar trend. So in 2011, in January, there were only 20 reported cases of liquid nicotine poisoning, as opposed to January of 2015, there were over 374 cases. And these are only cases that are reported. So oftentimes parents may not even be aware that their child is suffering from liquid nicotine poisoning as it presents many symptoms similar to other illnesses. So these are reported cases. When we talk about e-cigarettes and cessation, it's important to know that they are not FDA approved and that many different organizations have taken the stance to not recommend these products as a cessation device. So United States Preventative Services Task Force basically concluded that there is not enough current evidence to recommend electronic nicotine delivery systems for tobacco cessation in adults and including pregnant women. And they also recommend that clinicians stick with what we know is is approved and what works. So that's your nicotine patches, gum, um, prescription, Shantex, Wellbutrin. We're going to talk about some of those different products. But to continue to recommend what they have been recommending and not recommend e-cigarettes. The American Medical Association does not support recommending e-cigarettes as well, and they similarly recommend suggesting an approved medication. So if you are working with patients or clients, it's very it's nice to know that these organizations support that stance. That way, it's not just you personally taking that stance, but you can use these different organizations to say, hey, you know, these aren't recommended, and what we can instead do is use medication that we know is both regulated, standardized, and proven to work. The American Academy of Pediatrics has, while they don't recommend them for cessation, they've also taken a bit more of a stance. So they they suggest that e-cigarette sales not be sold to those under 18 years of age, which in Minnesota is already occurring, and that will now be nationally the same law. They also go as far to say that candy and fruit-flavored e-cigarettes should be banned. And then federal and state local governments should should go ahead and include e-cigarettes in clean indoor air and remove it from public places. And then to prevent poisonings, all e-liquids should be required to sold in childproof packaging, which again is law in Minnesota. The Minnesota Department of Health recommends that we educate that there is no safe level of nicotine exposure for vulnerable populations such as pregnant women, infants, children, or adolescents. Advise that the nicotine contained in products is highly addictive and that, again, if kids or really anyone comes in contact with liquid nicotine and isn't aware of the fact that they can be poisoned by it, that that's very dangerous. So most definitely keep these away from children, lock them up, keep them somewhere where it's not easily accessible. Don't keep them, ladies, in your purse where kids can rummage through and find them. So some interesting facts from the literature found that conventional cigarette smokers who have switched to e-cigarettes in hope of quitting have actually become dual users. And that's what we're seeing more and more frequently, is that people, while they attempt to use e-cigarettes to help them quit, they actually begin just using both. 
Multiple longitudinal studies have found people who use e-cigarettes were less likely to be abstinent at seven months. So while it may provide immediate relief, long-term it doesn't help them actually quit these tobacco products for good. Current studies raise doubts concerning the usefulness of e-cigarettes for facilitating smoking cessation. And then in a systematic review, 85% of e-cigarette users were no more likely to have quit one year later than non-users. And then interestingly enough, the last statement on the right side at the bottom says, tobacco companies are heralding e-cigarettes as the most significant harm reduction option ever available to smokers. But when they say that, remember that um, e-cigarette companies or all the tobacco companies have their own brand of e-cigarettes. So as public health, it's, it's sometimes concerning to think that they would really want users to quit because we know that they are invested in this market. So what can you do as a community health worker, as a nurse, as a physician? There are several things that you can do, and these are action items that you can do as you work with different clients and work within your communities. So screen patients for use of e-cigarettes. A lot of times they're only asked if they use tobacco, and many users of e-cigarettes do not consider themselves to be tobacco users. So make sure that you use vocabulary that's familiar with them. Discuss the misconceptions and then counsel those patients um, on how to actually use products that may be more effective than e-cigarettes. So when we say to screen patients, one thing to do is to screen them for both e-cigarette and other non-conventional tobacco product usage. So this includes hookah, it includes cigar use, any other type of tobacco that might be possible. Go ahead and ask about that as well. And remember that hundreds of products go by different names, so learn the vernacular. Ask about e-cigs, atomizer, vape pens, vape pipes, hookah pens, e-hookahs, e-vaporizers, e-cigars, or even e-pipes. Make sure that you ask the brand of device. That's one way to help kind of document usage. So ask what brand are they using, how frequently do they use it, do they use it five minutes after waking up, three hours after they wake up, kind of what's their pattern of use. And then ask them specifically how many milligrams of nicotine they are using. And then if your client declines using tobacco again, ask them in a couple different other ways to make sure that you are covering all the different types of tobacco products that are available. Discuss misconceptions around e-cigarettes. So we know that the media often markets these products as safe, as harm reduction, that it's just water vapor. Sit down and have these conversations with your patients. Identify and correct those misconceptions. While it is true that vapors are not, they don't have as much tar and other, carcin or other carcinogens, they still have liquid nicotine and there's very little research on the contents of vapor and preliminary studies are finding things like formaldehyde, especially at high voltages. So advise against their use and educate that exposure is still harmful and can lead to addiction. Again, we talk about that e-cigarettes are often cessation devices. That's a big misconception that you can actually counsel your patients on. So that while they're widely perceived as cessation, there is only low-level evidence to suggest that e-cigarettes are effective. Continue to recommend FDA-approved devices and medications. So here are some of those FDA-approved medications. Patients can receive nicotine, gum, lozenges, and patches without any prescription. So that's, that's very accessible. There's also things like a nasal spray or even an inhaler that if they have a prescription for, they can receive as well. And then buprepropine, which I have a difficult time saying, that's like Wellbutrin. And then Varenicline is Shantec. So there are different types of prescriptions available to help patients if they are looking to um, quit tobacco altogether. In Minnesota, there are quit plan services that are available. So these are specific to Minnesota, but this is a great service that's available. You do not need a doctor's prescription. All, ins all insurance companies offer this. Patients can receive counseling through text messaging and phone calls, and they often host promotions like Mini Quit Monday. So Mini Quit Monday is actually a contest that they help sponsor where they ask you to just remove one smoke break from your day. So you know, if, if a patient usually smokes on the way to work, that they cut that out. 
and they actually give prizes and money away for those. So this is a great service that's available um, for those that might be interested in, in quitting tobacco. So in conclusion, nicotine is nicotine. Whether it's conventional tobacco, e-cigarettes, hookah, or cigars, nicotine is nicotine, and it's highly addictive, and it comes with many health problems, and this is something that impacts our communities. And what we're finding is that while conventional cigarette use is decreasing, these other types are increasing. And so again, we need to start having conversations about nicotine. And be by becoming better educated, we can become better advocates in our communities and with the clients and patients that we see. References are available if you would like to learn more about these, about the different references, or even read more about some of the topics that we covered. Again, if you visit the www.panmn.org, these are all available online. Thank you for your time.